also you. Oh, you're the sweetest name, Lord Jesus. We hear that name and it brings exhilaration to our soul because we know that you have overcome everything in this world, Lord. And because you have overcome, we have overcome. Lord God, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. No matter what goes on at the, at the halls of government, in the economy, in society as a whole, as if all society uh, rejects you, Lord Jesus, you're still the king. You're still the Lord, and you're still coming again, Lord Jesus, with your people bow before your feet this morning, Lord Jesus. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you that you have made us salt and light in this world. And Lord, you're teaching us today how to open our eyes even further, Lord Jesus, to let the scales fall off, let the blinders fall off, that the things of this world grow strangely dim, as the song says, Lord, open the eyes of our heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're about to do. You're about to, to open up us, open, open us up, Lord Jesus, and to, to, to do a new thing among us, I believe, Lord. In this church, in these people, in me, Lord, in the past, we will start with me, Lord Jesus. I need to hear it before anyone, God, because I need to open my eyes. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Jesus, in spirit and in truth. You alone are worthy to receive praise and honor and glory and thanksgiving now and forever. We lift you up. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we pray these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, strong and mighty Son of God. Amen and amen. amen. Let's change gears a little bit. You want to do meeting in the air? Y'all know that song, don't you? It's in the red back hymnal. Tommy plays it a lot. It's kind of like an intro or an outro, but we don't sing it that often. There's a lot of words, so we're going to have to go easy on it and probably try to uh, learn it together. I've seen it all my life, but it's still hard to sing, but it's so much fun. A beautiful song. I'm talking about that meeting in the air. It's number. Number 10 is the very front of your red back hand. Hey, Miss Brenda. Let's sing it now. You have heard of little Moses in the bulrush. You have heard of fearless David and his sleep. You have heard the story told of grieving Joseph and of Jonah and the whale you often see. There are many, many others through the Bible. I would like to meet with you, all I do declare. By and by the Lord will surely let us meet there. At that meeting in the air. Of course now, there's going to be a meeting, or a meeting in the air. In the sweet, sweet by and by.
Did y'all get on that? Well, y'all were singing pretty good, weren't you? Yeah, we're driving at four speeds. We did. We kept <laughs> ramping it up a little bit. Now, Tony, hit it one time hard as you want to just play. Yeah. Listen to this. Listen to this. Now, this is this is good. Sing that third verse. I like that part. Sing that third verse. 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 on it a little bit. You couldn't sing Barry Had a Little Lamb until you worked on it a little bit, right? Yeah. So, well, that's just a fun, that's a fun song. You like that, Larry? Yeah. You, you remember that one, don't you? Oh, yeah. Larry remembers all these good old songs. Yeah. John, how about you? No? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll remember it one of these days. We'll say, we sing that same. Well, John, go on. I can never think about enough to keep up with it. <laughs> <laughs> when Tony gets on it, you're never going to get up, catch up with him. He uh he's camp meeting style. That's what we yeah. did camp meeting back in the old days, wasn't it? Was. Y'all want to sing another one? Who's got a, got anybody got a favorite? You just want to shout it out. Well, we got some here, but I want to do what you like. Y'all want to learn another one? I have somebody with me all the way. Anybody know that one? Y'all want to try it? This is slower. It's called I Have Somebody With Me All the Way. And it means you were listening to some old songs last night, and I put these down, and I told Tony knows them, and uh Angie knows them. And I used to sing these too, so let's let's try it, and we'll try at least one verse of it. If y'all, I think y'all will get onto this one a little quicker, because it's not as fast, right? Right. Tell me, the angel, teach to us. Need some bass singers back here. Got any, got any bass singers out there? <clears throat> we need Johnny Cash in here. <laughs> Somebody with me to share my 
sleep in there. <laughs> What's that? 120. 120. I bet I know what it is. 120. You know about it. Well, if you have yep. to walk up after that, girl, you just ain't going like that. All right. This is, this is a good one. You don't even have to have a book for this one. Victory in Jesus. <laughs> I heard an old story how a saint came from the world, how he gave his life for Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, a fresh blood of me. When I repented of my sins, one day. talk a little bit more about Jesus in here. I tell them, I don't preach to them, but I like to let them know that Jesus is walking with them and that they can be victorious. Amen. He tells us in his word, he said, we've been made more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. We will not lose. We cannot lose when Jesus walks with us. Amen. 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 It's so exciting to be a part of God's army and part of God's people, his family, and to, to love him and to serve him and to walk with him. And part of that is coming together to pray and to share. And so now, after we sing a few songs, I think it's time that we share with each other. Who's got something you'd like to share what the Lord is doing in your life? 
Miss uh, Joan, I don't think we've talked to you since all the funeral proceedings and stuff. Uh, how's your family? Everybody okay? It's been a tough time for y'all. Yeah. So hard. We love you and we've been praying with you and uh, just want you to know that. Amen. Anyone need, anyone would like to share? Yes, Claire. I spoke to Nino. Mm -hmm. And she's made it there. She said she'd be home on Tuesday. Good, good, good. I just saw this on my iPad. I thought that said Nino's made a comment on the video. I didn't see what it was, but okay. she's watching us. Hey, Nino's, we love you. Everybody say hey to Nino's. We're praying for you. So we play with that grandbaby. Enjoy it. Anyone else? Prayer requests, praise reports up here. Anyone? Oh. Jean is in. I went to see her daughter and son in law with the baby, and I'm keeping Jake. Jake, Jake. Oh, you get Jake. You love Jake, though, don't you? Jake's the boxer. Any a boxer? I don't know. No, he's not a boxer. I, I, remember I can't remember what Richie said, but he is he's a big dog, though. He attacks me. He loves to jump up on me. He's a big play dog, yeah. Gene, if you're watching, we love you and Kevin and pray for you to have a safe trip. God bless you. Anyone else? And yes. Jay is happy. Katie's birthday. My baby is turning 16 today. 16. Oh. Katie, happy birthday. I hope you watch. You think she'll watch later on? No, they're, they're pictures. But I'm going to have to leave early. Okay, we understand. Okay. I'm glad you're here, though. Thank yeah. you for coming anyway. Yes, Linda. And little Tiny that was here. Yes. She turns eight today. Turns eight. God yeah, bless wow. her. That's so sweet. <laughs> so sweet. Well, our Marissa turned 30 this week. I guess y'all saw that on Facebook. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. that, our baby girl is 30 <laughs> years old. That was hey, so Oh, yeah, tell us about that, Angie. <laughs> That's exciting yeah. stuff. we got a wedding coming up. Yeah. So, um, she and Dalton have a, they both are very unique in their um, likes and things that are special to them. And so, she she's never been a big jewelry person. Um, so, like they were, <laughs> unlike her mother, I don't know where she got that from. But anyway, she, um. They went up to Dahlonega and went mine, uh, mining, panning, whatever you call it, gym thingy, <laughs> and uh, found a, um, a Carolina ruby and an emerald and um, went in and talked to them and she, the lady showed them how they could have it set. Anyway, long story short, she said that when she saw what the ruby would look like when it was finished, and it's not like the kind of rubies that we, you know, it's more, it's different. And she, she said she could fasten it or she could, you call it polish it and make it like a and she liked the polish look um and so he got that he's having that set for her and then he went outside on the of course at that point she knew what was going on and then he took her outside and knelt down and proposed to her um and his son was with them so he took some pictures and then apparently they got some bystander to come take a picture of all three of them so she's excited and uh, we're excited and uh, we love Dalton a lot. He's a precious boy. Yes. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's good. So he I'm had good. the daddy talk with me, and I put all the hard questions to him, and he passed the test. So <laughs> I told him, we already consider you part of the family, but we talked for a good long while. I believe he's a strong man, and I believe he loves Marissa, and he's going to take care of her. So what more can you ask? It's just a beautiful thing. I'm so happy that they're, they're getting together and they're, they're going to uh, be married. Also, speaking of family issues, we were just talking last night. Stacia was over at the house with little Caroline. Charlotte and Thomas were at the deer, deer hunting camp down in uh, down at their farm. And um, Stacy said, well, we're still going to dedicate Caroline at Satan, aren't we? And I said, I hope so. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. We were kind of hoping so. Yes, yes. So y'all be kind of thinking about that and praying with us about it because one of these days soon we're going to ask y'all to give us a Sunday and we'll just have a baby dedication in here. And I'm just so excited. Yeah. Well, so anybody else's? Yeah, we could do, we could do others. But... Uh, I was just so excited. The time before was so special to me when we dedicated Charlotte. Y'all all participated, celebrated with us. It's just fun. So, children are a gift from the Lord. Amen. And they're just two that just came in right there. And I'm so yeah. glad to see them. I'm so glad to see you guys this Whoa. morning. God bless you. How are you doing? Good, good. Miss Anastasia, are you doing good? Yeah. Good. It's so good to see you. We love you. Who else has a prayer report? Prayer request before we pray. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. 
And that's a friend telling me that he runs in her family. Oh, my yeah, goodness. I think about that. Her up. Rachel Turner. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely lift her up to the Lord. Ask the Lord to touch that situation. Yes. Jesus. Well, Who else? Anyone else? We all ready to pray? Halloween morning this week, my my little boy, 280 pounds, will be 40 years old. Wow. Yeah. What don't seem like yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's uh, bow our heads and let's seek Him first while He speaks to us individually. I believe that He'll speak if we'll listen. And at that right time, when God gives us to go ahead, we will all uh, pray together with a pastoral prayer and then the Lord's prayer as He directs our hearts. Missy says something. Yes, Missy. Chris can't make it today. What? Chris can't make it today. Chris, okay. Let's pray for Chris. And also, of course, for Tony, Tony Chronic, and, uh, and their, all their family. And uh, just lift everyone up that's not here. Ann and Craig and others that are, are not here with us today. Thank you, Lord. Bless it be the name of the Lord. We'll seek the Lord while he may be found. Oh, Jesus, you're so good. I like to tell him he's good every day, every day. Multiple times within the day. Jesus, you're good. Lord, we don't ever want to forget how good you are, Lord. Things sometimes get a hold of us and it seems like things are hopeless and helpless, but Lord Jesus, you're good. You're good. And I have somebody with me all the way, just like that old song said we just learned, Lord. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. You alone are worthy to receive honor and praise and glory. Thanksgiving forever, forever. You are worthy, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I ask for you to touch these. Lord, we had a bunch of praises today. Lord, people praising God for birthdays and grandkids and kids. And Lord, we're talking about baby dedications and, and, and kids coming into the church. Lord Jesus, what a wonderful, wonderful blessing you've given us, Lord, to be the body of Christ and to love each other. To be so privileged to be here just for a few days in this church, Lord. And Lord, we'll give it over to some kids one of these days, God, that have been trained in your ways, Lord Jesus. But right now, you've called us right here together. What a special thing that is, Lord Jesus. I just want to thank you for it. I want to thank you for staying at Methodist Church. Lord, you brought us through so much over the past few years. And Lord, you're building a, a new thing downstairs. Lord, you're bringing in the money. Lord, and the ladies selling cookbooks and everybody's excited about it, Lord. And God, I just ask that you continue to call people in, Lord. Children will come in those doors, Lord. And adults will come in those doors, Lord. Younger people, Lord. Older people. Yeah, every, all, all walks of life, Lord Jesus. But we don't qualify them, Lord. You bring hearts, Lord Jesus, and we'll love whoever comes, Lord Jesus. We love you, first of all. Lord, and that love is shed abroad in our hearts, God, and you've called us to be a blessing to others, Lord, and we want to be that blessing, God. Lord, for missions around the world, Lord, I believe we're going to touch people. Lord, I want to go ahead and pray for the offering that we're about to take up, God, because it's a special time of worship. Lord, and I believe you're going to bless each and every soul who will sacrificially give, Lord. We're about to do those shoe boxes too, Lord. And I pray, God, that your blessings would already be accumulating on those, Lord, that right now you're setting that appointment, that divine appointment, that child that will receive that shoe box, Lord. As we pack it, Lord, I pray that that child will be in our heart, Lord. We may never know them, but Lord Jesus, you have a divine appointment for those gifts of love that we will send. Lord, you can use this church to do great big things all over the world, Lord, and all over this community. And I thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, for Rachel Turner, God, I pray that you touch her, Lord, this issue with blood. Lord, we don't understand it, but Lord, I know you do. And God, I know that you're with her. God, I pray that as she seeks to serve you, so that you would draw her heart very, very close to you. Lord, I pray that you would touch her and bless her and keep her. Lord, I think about Tony Chronic today. Lord, I know he has so many health difficulties. God, I pray that you touch Tony. I believe he'll be watching this at some point, Lord. And Lord, I hope, I pray, God, that you would just let him know the love that surrounds him and his whole family right now, Lord. And Lord, for Joan and for Janelle and and all the families surrounding Miss Willene's loss, Lord, and Jan, Lord, oh, our heart still is so sad for uh, to be without Jan here in our church, Lord. I just thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy and your tender love. Lord God, you understand what loss is like. You understand grief on a very deep level, on a soul level, Lord Jesus, because you grieve. You understand it, Lord Jesus, and you specialize in broken hearts, Lord. I pray that those hearts would continue to mend, Lord, even if it's ever so slowly, Lord, that, that you would continue to work in their hearts, Lord Jesus, and in our hearts as a church, Lord, that we know that greater days are coming, Lord, and that 
in just a few more days, you're going to see those loved ones again who die in you, Lord Jesus, either at the coming of the Lord or when we go on our way into, into your arms, Lord, in our own passing. Lord Jesus, we will see them again. Lord, that's the blessed hope you give us, and I'm so thankful for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, I speak to Ninos, Lord, in her, her trip to see her grandchild. Lord, thank you that she got there well. Give her just a wonderful time, a wonderful uh, uh, season with her grandchild, Lord. Lord, and I thank you for families. I thank you for love. I thank you for grace. I thank you for mercy. And I thank you most of all for salvation, Lord. Because without you, Jesus, we couldn't have any of this, Lord. We couldn't have anything. Lord, we would be on a, a we'd be lost in our sins forever. But God, you have taken our feet and placed it on a rock. Lord Jesus, you have taken us from uh, hell and sin and suffering into your very presence, Lord Jesus. We're seated with you in heavenly places. So thankful, Lord Jesus. I bless your name. I bless your name with my congregation today, Lord. And now we pray as Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Brother Bobby, would you grab our offering plate and bring it forward? If you haven't had a chance to uh, use the offering plate, he will stop by if you just raise your hand and we will worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. We've already thanked him for it. We've already blessed it. We believe that God's going to use it in a mighty, mighty way. Simple seed, a simple seed of faith can be expanded because Jesus is a multiplier, just like he multiplied fishes and loaves in his day among 5,000 people eating to their field with baskets left over. He can take your simple seed and he can expand it to touch all over this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Tony, play for us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Sandy. You will with me. Let's declare our faith with people all over this world and all through the halls of church history as we declare the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated in God's house today. Y'all want to sing something just off the cuff? We don't have one planned, but we would like to sing something to lead us into the sermon, if you will. We did that in him, we didn't do yeah. 310. 310. 310 in the red bag. 310. We, we're teaching y'all some new songs here. <clears throat>
praising Christ the blessed Savior with heart and with voice. Tell him how we came to love him and make him our choice. That will be a glad reunion day. That will be a day, a wonderful day. That will be a day, a glorious day. There are all the holy angels and loved ones to say. That will be a glad reunion day. Y'all ready for some preaching? I'm ready to preach a sermon. Excited about it. Luke chapter 10. We'll be continuing in our series in Luke. We've been in Luke for a little over a year. I'm probably going to take a shortcut. Probably preach Luke next week. And then over the holidays, I'll be preaching some Thanksgiving themes and some Christmas themes. We may just go back to Luke and continue through that. But uh, the Lord hasn't really impressed upon me which direction to take it at this point. But I love preaching in series because we know where we're going. We're going straight through the ministry of Jesus. And every week, it's about discipleship, ultimately. It's about walking with Jesus. It's about knowing his will for our life. It's about following him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. That's our theme today when we talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, we've heard about this all of our lives. One of the most popular teachings is in the sense of most well-known teachings of Jesus. Even people who aren't students of the scriptures will know what we mean when we talk about the Good Samaritan, about the Good Samaritan who did a good thing for someone in need. Jesus used this powerful story to teach powerful heavenly lessons. But before we begin, I'm gonna turn this microphone off and just go to my voice. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 23, before he starts the parable of the Good Samaritan, there's one comment that I didn't get to in my sermon last week, and it's so important, so important, and it creates an environment, a segue for today's sermon, I believe. He says in verse 23, Luke says, then he turned to his disciples and said privately, privately, just for their ears only. He didn't talk to the crowd. This was for them. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. You see, guys, nobody to this day has seen the things that you're seeing. Nobody has heard the words that you're hearing. You are so privileged and so uh, uh, special to be trusted with these words of life, to be trusted with this training that you're receiving. And when I hear Jesus talking to the disciples, that was 2,000 years ago. That was before he ever went to the cross. That was before he ever rose from the dead and showed himself to hundreds of people between the time he uh, rose from the dead and he ascended to his father. That was completely before the time when the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost upon 3,000 people who got saved that day and many others the church formed in a day. And through the years, people have faced persecution and trials because of the witness of Jesus, because of what he's done in their lives. Where are we? 
in 2024, oh dear friends, no one has seen what we have seen. No one in world history has known the glory that we see today. Now we haven't seen it all. There's some things we're yet to see. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us, we still see through a glass darkly. We're still, we're still seeing some things. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but one day we will know him as he is. We'll see him as he is. But for now, we have been given this witness, this holy, holy witness from the scripture. Oh, the scripture comes alive in my heart and it does in your heart because when I preach, I can see it in your eyes. I can see it the way you dig into the scriptures that it means something. It's not just an ancient book. It's not just something we do. It's life. The scriptures are life. They are sustenance. We cannot survive as Christians without the word of God. And he has poured it out upon us freely. I just want us to remember that we're in the same positions the disciples were, only better. That they hadn't seen yet the things that we have seen. They hadn't known the things that we have been made known. And Jesus is teaching us more every day. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's talk about this parable of the Good Samaritan. Let me begin reading in verse 25 for our main text. It says this, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In Jesus' reply, he said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened by on the other side of the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn and he took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Dear friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, go and do likewise. Lord, I hear that deep resonating in my spirit, Lord. Give us utterance and revelation knowledge right now, Lord. Lord, we're simple minds, Lord, and we can understand apart from the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you in advance because you're making this plain and simple so that we can live by it. We can see the increase of your word. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As I began to consider this story, I began to think about what did Jesus mean by this story? Now, it was a parable. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning is a simple definition of a parable. Not necessarily factually true, but I believe that Jesus probably based it on stories that had actually happened right there. It was probably a conglomeration or a, a composite of several different stories that had happened because this road between Jericho and Jerusalem, about 17 miles in terms of that day, wasn't that far. You know, they would routinely walk 20 miles in a day. But this road was a desert. This world road was a, a barren land complete desert. And from what I'm told, uh, New Testament Jericho, not the Jericho of the Old Testament, this had been rebuilt. Jericho was built on an oasis in the desert. And travelers would be wonderfully blessed when they got to Jericho because it was lush. It was green. There was so much water there. But in between Jerusalem and Jericho, it was treacherous. It was treacherous. There were predators, both animal and man, that frequented that highway in between the two cities. It was a perfect hiding spot for professional robbers, not just, not just people who were up to mischief. These were professional thieves that would go and lay wait for people. So this was and probably something that had happened over and over, and it was very relevant to the people because they knew that road. They had walked it before, and Jesus made a beautiful, beautiful story to teach them in the spiritual realm. Go and as you're going. 
talk a lot about that in discipleship. Going as you're going. We all got stuff to do. We got families to raise. God loves families. He's called us all to raise families. Grandchildren now. Great grandchildren, some of us. We're all involved with our families. We all, most of us have a job or, a, or something that we're doing. If we're retired, we have something that keeps us up and, and it gets us up in the morning and that we enjoy doing, that we do that's productive. As we're going, we're going to see things. We're going to see opportunities that Jesus gives us. We're going to have to keep our eyes focused on Him, our ears and our spirit focused on what Jesus is wanting to show us because if we see things, we're going to understand who our neighbor is. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Who is our neighbor? Jesus answers that question for us in this passage. Some people, sometimes we can get so caught up in our lives, we just don't want to be bothered. Oh, the phone rings. Who is that? Oh my goodness. We, uh, somebody comes up to the door. People don't come to the door too much anymore because people are so private. You remember the day when salesmen would knock on your door. I had a guy from AT&T, their cable in our neighborhood, came to the door the other day. I just looked at him. I said, are you AT&T? I didn't even open the door. I opened the screen door and he goes, yeah. I said, Thank you, but no, leave, leave. I don't want at and I'm just fine with my internet. I said, sorry. I tried to be nice. He just waved and smiled. I'd hate to be a door-to-door -door salesman today. But anyway, we ignore those kind of things. But Jesus brings us into contact with people constantly every day. I talk about the kids on my bus. I try to remember they're my mission field. And I told you before, they aggravate me so bad sometimes. In the afternoon, especially that crew there, ready for bear. I mean, they're ready. They're so ready to go home, I guess. They scream and they holler. And I say, sit down, sit down, sit down, over and over. But Lord, I love those little kids. I hate to think about giving them up because they're my mission field. And I speak to them and I pray that God shows me the love in their hearts and the needs in their hearts. Sometimes I can tell when one of them is sad. I'll take them aside and say, are you okay? What's happening with you? And it may be something little, but there may be something going on at home too. We got to be attuned to people around us. We got to know, uh, ask Jesus to show us what's happening in people's lives. Can you not be bothered? Are we too good to be bothered? Are we oblivious to people all around us and what they're going through? Oh, it's so easy. I thought about this. It always comes to my mind. It still plagues me at times. I know the Lord has forgiven me if, if he was calling me to do that. But one time I was getting on 316 over at the Oconee Connector, and it was about rush hour time. And you know how it gets out there. And it came the most monstrous thunderstorm. It was just flashing, lightning, and sheets of rain coming down. I could hardly see in front of my face. And I was coming in that uh, lane where you go, where you can either get on the bypass or you can get on over and go down Etz Bridge Road. And I saw a guy running up the road. He had his coat up over his head. His <laughs> coat wasn't doing it much good in those sheets of rain. And he was running. And I looked over and I saw his car over there and his lights were flashing. And before I could think and before I could stop, something said to me, stop and get him. Get him. Help him. He's in the middle of a storm. And I, the first, you know what's the first thing I thought of? He'll get my car so wet. It's just going to be a mess. He's already soaked. I don't want to get soaked. And by that time, by the time I'd made that middle process in my mind, I was too far gone. And, I, and the Lord captured my heart and said, you were supposed to get him. But then I looked back and I couldn't even see it. And I said, Lord, I think I missed the opportunity. I missed the opportunity. I know the Lord forgives us for stuff like that, but that came to my mind as a time when God may have had a divine appointment that I missed. Oh, folks, we got to be tuned to that. And that's just a simple illustration. I would have given anything if I'd have stopped and got that guy. I don't care if he got my car wet, but I missed it that time. I asked God, don't let me miss the divine appointment. Let, don't let me be oblivious to what's going on around me. We look at this instance where Jesus teaches a parable about a Samaritan. We know what we talked last week and I think the week before too about Samaritans. Jesus talks a lot about them because the Jews did not like Samaritans. Matter of fact, I'd say they hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated Jews. It was a racist thing. They hated them just because of who they were. No good reason. Just we don't like each other. And we know the history there. They were considered half-breeds. They were considered only partially Jewish and they had their own system of worship, their own temple and each one thought the other was profane. So they didn't want anything to do with Samaritans. So Jesus just picked out a good old Samaritan guy to show them exactly what he meant by this parable. Samaritan was the one who was listening to the Lord, who did what Jesus requires in the law. Number one, let's think about this. The expert in the law, a lawyer, a lawyer. Now, a lawyer in that day was a little bit different. He was an expert in civil law as well as ceremonial law, as law, the law of Moses, because they were one. You know, we have this concept we know as separation of church and state in our country, and the two aren't enjoined. But in that day, it was a theocracy, and civil law was 
church law. Civil law was the law of Moses. They all went together. So the law of Moses was what decided matters of state as well. So this guy was a intellectual. This guy was well-trained. The Bible calls him an expert in the law. And he came to Jesus to test him. He didn't come to worship him. He didn't come to find out more about him. He came to try to make a spectacle of Jesus. He wanted to back him into a corner and have him uh, spill what he was really about so that he could take an intellectual authority over Jesus. He came to make a spectacle of him. So Jesus answers his question. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the law. He said, you're a lawyer. I know who you are. He said, you know it all. So you tell me, what does the law of Moses say? And he says, he says, I'm going to read it for you right from the scripture. The man says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That was a quote directly from Moses in the Old Testament. It was repeated over and over. Matter of fact, it's called the Hebrew Shema. Have you ever seen Orthodox Jews to this day, the super uh, Orthodox conservative Jews will have the little phylactery that they'll put on their head. It's a little box that they'll put on their head because God said to write his law on your mind. And as a symbol of their dedication to the law, they will put this Hebrew Shema on a piece of paper, a piece of scroll, and strap it to their head as they pray to remind them of this all-important Hebrew Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In other words, with everything in you. Love God more than anything. Love God above everything. God must be your priority. And what does that work into? If you do that, what's going to happen in your own life? You're going to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the man answered Jesus, and it was perfect. Jesus said, you know it. You just said it to me. You just said it to me. But that backed that man into a corner, you see. Because Jesus had him answer a question with a question, and the man probably felt confused or embarrassed, or this is not working out like I had figured, because it made him look bad. It made him look bad because Jesus asked the right question. And so this man said to justify himself. The scripture says he said it specifically to justify himself. Well, who is my neighbor? He was smart aleck is what he was. Smart aleck. He said, who is my neighbor? You think so much of a neighbor, Jesus. You tell me who is my neighbor? Jesus as a storyteller. Oh, Jesus was the master storyteller. Jesus would say, let me tell you a little story. And when he said that, the crowd grew hush. I mean, Jesus was such a good storyteller, you could hear a pin drop when he said, let me tell you a little story. Jesus talked about this man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers. We're talking about number one, the first point that I want to see, and I think it's in your bulletin. Yeah, I put the points in here. Eternal life is the goal. He asked Jesus, he said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Well, we know in our day, we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Forgive my sins, Lord. Come into my life. The Holy Spirit opens our eyes of our heart. He opens our eyes of our heart and we can see Jesus. We can see what he's done for us. We can see our dire need, our dire circumstances, and we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we believe and we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we are saved. Oh, dear friends, we are saved. Eternal life is the goal. Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A Jewish person to this day believes about heaven and hell. They call it Olam Haba, which means the world to come. It depends on what they believe about God. Secular Jews who are Jews by uh, nationality, unlike uh, others who, who believe spiritually as Jews, they uh, believe that at death, that they just go round and round until things are over. Kind of like uh, Buddhism or any other world religion you might consider. Jews with mystical leanings may even believe in reincarnation and others in resurrection. But traditional Judaism teaches that after death our bodies go to the grave, but our souls go before God to be judged. And then we look at some other facets of it, and we believe that according to a merit system based on God's accounting of all our actions and motives, traditional Jewish thought is that only the very righteous go directly to heaven. All others must be cleansed of residual sin. But it doesn't sound like the gospel to me. It's not the gospel. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a false gospel. And it's just like any other world religion. It's not very far from Islam. I've studied a little bit of Islam. That's pretty much what Islam believes. 
that God's going to weigh our good versus our bad. And when we get there, nobody will know till we get there. And he's going to decide, did he do better good? Did he do better bad? And, and then he'll decide. Dear friends, that is false. That is false according to the scripture because there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible tells us that any righteousness that I feel like I have is like a filthy rag to God. It doesn't mean that it's not good and that God doesn't want us to live a righteous life. But anything I can do, I, I can be as righteous as I want to be and I'm going to turn around and act like a reprobate the next day because I have sin. I have a flesh and the, I don't believe that we have to sin. I don't believe that that's required. I don't believe that that's something that God is the author of. But we know from a practical standpoint and from the Word of God that we're not perfect and we're not going to be perfect until we see Him as He is. Now God is in the process of making us holy every day. We're responsible to Him for the way we behave and by the way we live our lives. But dear friends, I want you to understand nobody's perfect. There is none righteous, no, not one. And I cannot envision myself standing before God one day with a scale with a scale. And what if it's right there and it's doing this? And, and there's just one little thing that, that keeps me out of heaven. That's not a God who loves you. That's not a God who gave himself for you. That's not a God who came and shed his own blood so that you could be saved. God is a God of grace. Grace and mercy. Grace meaning God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve which is hell and death. And God has committed his love toward us that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, this is glorious. Eternal life is the goal. And Jesus has shown us the keys to eternal life. It's interesting that Old Testament Jews saw eternal life as the ultimate, the ultimate life with God. Their understanding was severely limited without the fullness of the gospel. It's completed in Christ's atonement and what he did for us. But their desire was there. And it seems that every society, even the most pagan person, the most uh, atheist or agnostic person on the street, has some notion of eternal life within them. Because we understand that we are eternal beings. God has created us to live eternally. Some will live eternally in their sin and some will see the just reward for their sin. Others will see the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and live with him eternally. Oh, praise God. Praise God for his mercy and his grace. The law, the law says that I have to do these things. I need to do these things if I want to spend eternity with God. If I obey the law, I will serve my neighbor. I serve my neighbor by obeying the law. God says that I must see the needs of my neighbor. He said, who is my neighbor? We've got to know who we're talking about before we can see to their needs. Number two, it's written in the law. It's written in the law. The professional expert in the law said, what must I do? What must I do? In the Greek there emphasizes the word doing. What must I do? The very question that the man was asking tells us that he had the completely wrong orientation. His reasoning was fatally flawed. His question reveals that he was tempting Jesus. The King James Version says, but really he was goading Jesus. That's what that would mean. Tempting Jesus would mean goading Jesus to try to say something wrong so that he could hang him on his own words. The lawyer subscribed to a works-based salvation that he could work hard enough, that he could do enough so that God would have to accept him, so that he would be not rejected by God on the basis of law, the basis of rules. There's a powerful parallel, powerful, powerful parallel that came to my mind. I remember in the book of Acts when Paul and Silas were in a jail in Philippi in the Philippian jailer. Do you remember that when the earthquake came and shook the place and it released the bonds and, and they could all just leave if they wanted to because God had rescued Paul and Silas and the jailer was about to commit suicide and he said I, he was going to be killed by the Roman government if those prisoners got away. Paul and Silas said, don't do it. We're still here. We're still here. We're still here. And he said, sirs, what must I do? to be saved. What must I do to be saved? He realized his lost condition. There is one thing you can do and that is place yourself on the mercy seat of Jesus. Come to him. Give him all that you have and say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I can't save myself. He knew that whatever he did would not save him, that only Jesus could save him. But this powerful young ruler who came before Jesus was counting on his own righteousness. Counting on his own righteousness. Ephesians chapter 2, I quote it to you often. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, for which God prepared in advance for us to do. Prepared in advance from the foundation of the world. Yes, there are good works involved, but salvation comes first. Salvation comes first and foremost because eternal life is the goal. It's written in the law. We are taught to pray. Number three, I have people all the time tell me, Preacher, pray for me. Preacher, give me a blessing. Pray for this, pray for that. Everybody wants to be prayed for when they get into trouble, don't they? Everybody wants to be prayed for when they get into trouble. But during good times, do they come to church? Do they want to pray? Not usually, not usually. I remember we were ministering in prison one night. And there was a group of prisoners coming through on work detail. And my good buddy, Brother Reed Calloway, who taught me so much about prison, prison ministry, those guys hollered, hey, preacher, preacher, give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. And I thought, what's he going to do? I wanted to watch it real close because I wouldn't know what to say if they told me that. And Reed looked at him. He pointed his finger and said, I'll bless you. At, you be blessed as you seek to serve Jesus. As you seek to serve Jesus. And that was a good answer. Very good answer. The guy just kind of looked at him and moved on. Not going to bless somebody who doesn't seek to serve Jesus. I don't have any blessing for that. God says that that He is He, is, he blesses the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. It's good to pray for people. I don't mean that I don't pray for people. It's a blessing we can give. God hears the cries of His people, and I will pray for people. I'll pray continuously sometimes for people I don't even know. You ever have somebody you'll see during the day and somehow God puts them in your heart? You'll never meet them. You'll never know them. But God says pray. And I'll, I've learned to stop and pray for that person. Some of them I remember from years ago. And I, don't, I have no idea what their name is. I don't even know if they're still alive. But Lord, I remember that time you put it on my heart to pray for that person. If they're still alive, Lord, touch their heart. Touch them, Lord. God gives us a spirit of prayer to pray continuously for people. And God will introduce us to certain people. God will show us certain people. That's the one that God is looking for. That's what God is looking for from us, I believe. And I believe that's what he's telling us. This is our neighbor. This is our neighbor. That person who stands in the need of prayer. That person that we might not even have an actual introduction to. That person that we see. But we might have someone standing in line next to us at the store. We might have someone walking down the street and we nod and say hello and talk about it's a pretty day. Might have a chance to speak the name of Jesus. Might have a chance to pray for someone right there. That's our neighbor. That's the one that God is calling us to. It's good to pray for people. How can we walk right past someone who is half dead and half beaten and just say, I'll pray for you? That's what the Levite and that's what the priest did. It's interesting because the priest was a professional clergyman. He was the preacher. He was one of the preachers at the temple. The priest, we know what a priest is. The priest came by and he had to go around him. And a lot of people believe it was probably because ceremony, ceremonial cleanness. That he, if he touched a, a, a man who was defiled in any way, first of all, he was a Samaritan. They believed all Samaritans were nasty. And if he touched a man who was about half dead, he might become ceremonially unclean and he might not be able to be religious anymore. So how messed up is that? How messed up, how twisted, that's the devil. That's how the devil teaches. That's the doctrine of demons. That's the doctrine that comes from the pits of hell. That we're too good to get our hands dirty. That we're too good to reach out and touch someone in need. Someone who's hurting. Someone who needs our help. Then a Levite came by. I always thought Levites were priests, but all, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Because Levites were often served in the temple as you could call them associate pastors by our, our terminology today. They were professional religious people who kept the temple up and who worked in the temple, but they weren't priests. The Levite crossed the road to get away from him too. Didn't want to have no part of him. These guys were superb Jews. These guys would believe that they knew the law of Moses through and through, but yet they turned their back on a man who was beaten and half dead. Here comes a Samaritan, the half-breed, the one that they couldn't stand, the one that they thought was just the lowest of the low, just, uh, just a, a person that they wouldn't have anything to do with. That good Samaritan, we call it. The good Samaritan went to the man. He poured in oil and wine on his wounds. And by wine, we mean probably a high alcohol content wine that they kept for first aid purposes to antiseptic the wound, to, to cleanse it really well. And oil that would start the healing process. And he bound up his wounds. He didn't worry about getting his hands dirty. 
He didn't worry about, I might catch something if I touch that nasty Samaritan, or I don't want to have anything to do with Samaritan. I'm just going to pretend like I didn't see it. He couldn't live with himself if he didn't go to the man because God's love. God's love had constrained this man, this dirty Samaritan who they didn't even want to recognize his existence. He was the man that God had chosen for the moment in this story. Oh, dear friends, open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes. I'm almost finished. But we sang that song today. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, first of all. I want to see you high and lifted up. But when we put Jesus in the top spot, when we have Jesus as our priority, dear friends, every other priority will fall into place. Everything else is going to line up, going to start to fall into place just right. Oh, there's other priorities that he has for us, but until we get that one right, until Jesus is high and lifted up, and above all, above all in our lives, dear friends, we're never going to succeed how God wants us to succeed in this life. Oh, God calls us to set him as our priority. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. Finally, as I finish up, I want to talk about that last point. Real compassion moves to action. The Bible says the Samaritan had pity on him. Pity on him. That's in the NIV version. Another translation would say compassion. Compassion. Oh, Jesus has compassion. Jesus is a compassionate Savior. Jesus is a compassionate Lord. It says he would look at Israel and he would weep over his own people because they were tossed and helpless and they were like sheep without a shepherd. Oh, Jesus has a heart of compassion. He wants us to take his heart. He wants to give us his heart of compassion. Do we have compassion for sinners? Do we have compassion for the people around us? Do we have compassion for people who are broken and helpless and hopeless? Are we ready to go to them with the passion and the compassion of Jesus? Oh, let's don't talk about it. Let's don't talk about it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Psalm 41.1 says, Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. Proverbs 14.31 Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the poor needy honors God. Isaiah 117 says, Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead the case of the widow. Real compassion is going to move us to action. Oh, dear friends, Jesus is a Lord of compassion. Jesus has great, great compassion. Let's pray. Who is my neighbor? My neighbor is everyone out there who... who Jesus loves. You won't meet anyone today, tomorrow, or any other day that Jesus loves any more or any less than you. Oh, dear friends, Jesus has called us to our neighbor. That's anyone. It's anyone who needs help. Anyone who needs help. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He's called us to be wise and to listen to the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus loves me. Sing it with me. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones in me love. They are
Yes, Lord. Y'all say, hey, Lester. Hey, Lester. Shirts. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh wow. Look at that. Y'all want us to do it? Say you want to see our children's prayer? You want to do our prayer song? Do our prayer song. God our Father. God our Father. We thank you. We thank you for our many blessings. For our many blessings. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray you bless the people of State of Methodist Church. Lord, I thank you for people who care, Lord. I thank you for people who look out for their neighbor, Lord. I thank you, God, for the blessing and the peace and the grace and the glory that you've given us today. Lord, show us that person that we need to help, Lord. Let us know it, uh, Lord, that you would speak. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We want to see you. In Jesus' name we pray and dismiss. Amen. amen and amen. Glory to God. Enjoy each other. Dismiss and hug each other. Internet audience, we love you. Cindy Wang, are you watching today? I told you I was going to talk to you. And uh, Tony Chronic, hope you're watching today. Ninos, hope you're watching. Uh, Chet Holiday, you watch every week. Rick San Roxana, different ones. I'm so thankful for y'all. So thankful for technology that we can we can actually worship together virtually. So thank you so much. Join us next week, same time, same place. We love you. God bless you.